Well, today we have the privilege of meeting with the mayor of a bustling Ontario city. Uh, we have the privilege of not only hearing his heart for public service, uh, but also his powerful transformational story. Uh, welcome to the 100 Huntley Street show, Mr. Mayor Dan Carter. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to be with you today. It's, so, great, it's great to see it's you It's so again. great to see you. Yeah, so we saw each other uh, a little earlier this year at the Ontario Prayer Breakfast. Yeah. And uh, you were the guest speaker and just shared an inspirational message and your personal story, which was gripping. I knew we had to have you on the show <laughs> as soon as I heard it. Uh, so thank you for coming. I want to talk first a little bit about uh, your journey as a mayor yeah. and, and then your personal faith uh, story and how the two intersect. So uh, you are a beloved mayor. You became mayor in 2018 hey. and then re-elected in 2022. Yes. So tell us, were, did you always have an aspiration to be a mayor? What led to you? No, to be absolutely honest, I, I, it came down to, first and foremost, it's great to be with you yeah. once again, and I really appreciate it. I, I, I was a broadcaster for a long period of time, and I, uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed was interviewing people so that I um, learned more. Somebody said to me one time, know an inch thick about everything, and that gave me the opportunity to really get that opportunity to learn as much as I possibly could. But in 2014, I was asked by a provincial party to be able to run. And I, I kind of ducked away from it. It was about the third or fourth time I had been asked. And Paula finally said to me, she said, you know what, sooner or later, you're gonna have to make up your mind if you're gonna run for public office. And a lot of it came down to fear. And it was, mm -hmm. if you put your name on the ballot and you lose, you know, and I'm a public figure at that time, I, I was really scared of that. And so Paula had said, um, you either put your name on a ballot or you stop talking about politics. So in 2014, I put my name on a ballot to be a regional and city councillor um, and not knowing how to run a campaign and just hoping and praying I did all the right things. And we were uh, pretty successful. We uh, gathered three, uh, the third highest vote count, which was really surprising. As a matter of fact, I broke down when it happened mm. because it was just overwhelming. And uh, so I started my political career as a regional and city councillor. And then 2018, the mayor of the great city of Oshawa at that time came to me and said, Danny, I need you to run for mayor. I said, I've only been here four years. I've got so much more to learn. Right. He said, I'm really glad you think that. I'm not asking, I'm telling you you're running for mayor. And uh, I went to my wife and I said to Paula, I said, um, so what do you think? She went, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is your decision. And so... I got a, uh, some of my uh, closest advisors together and said, what do you think? And, you know, kind of answered and then asked all the questions about my own insecurities. And we were successful in our first uh, campaign. It was funny. We uh, almost got 70 percent. We got 69 point yeah. something percent. I was in Cornwall speaking at a, at a conference and uh, they introduced me and said, you know, Mayor Carter almost got 70%. And the whole crowd went, oh, that was fantastic. <laughs> I said, but nobody else was running, so it's not that <laughs> impressive. Right. But it, we did really well. And then uh, in 2022, we, uh, we were reelected with 65% yeah. of the vote. So I'm really pleased about it. Yeah, so a really interesting time to be in politics today, especially where our country is and where the nation is, where the world is. So it's been a wonderful journey so far. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So you've been a mayor of a great city in a really challenging time through the pandemic what are some of the things that are more difficult maybe than you anticipated in as, as being a mayor maybe what are some of the things that are more fulfilling than you anticipated I, I i think that um i was blessed because of the reason that being a broadcaster i think what it helped me do was that fed my ego prior to me going into public office mm -hmm. <clears throat> so i thought that that was that was a wonderful gift that i was given what I didn't realize when I got into the office was the responsibility and how people look at you as a mayor. I'm just Dan, and, and, I, and it was funny because I knew people at City Hall for a long period of time, and I walked into City Hall, and they said, uh, good morning, your worship, and I went, no, no, I'm Dan. And so that was a big adjustment to try and get used to. Mm -hmm. Then the responsibility of, of really understanding you're the CEO, you're the chief encourager officer, and you're the chief consoler officer. So the job itself took a long time to be able to embrace and really understand um, how do I do this job? And I talked to CEOs and I said, how long does it take you to get comfortable? And they said about three and a half years. And I went, oh my goodness. But it did take about three and a half to four years before you're really comfortable in that role. Um, but it is, 
I, before I came into office, three days before I came into office, the largest employer in our community made an announcement they were closing, which yeah. was General Motors. Yeah. And this, is, this was probably the greatest lesson I ever learned, that words matter at certain times, and you have to make sure that you understand that because mm. you cannot allow emotion to drive your decision-making. You, you have to look at um, the words that you use, the tone that you use, the way that you present. You have to balance that between in, uh, keeping your community not fearful but hopeful but also realistic, and, and that was a great lesson for me right off the bat. Yeah, wow, uh, and so much there in what you shared. And being hopeful is something you learn personally in your own story. Yeah. So you shared at the Ontario Breakfast about the real low time you went through as a teenager, a homelessness, really difficult, hard journey. Uh, but your story is just a transformational miracle story from where you were to where you are now. Uh, and I think there's a lot of hope there. Could you share with us a bit about your personal journey? Well, you know, before I start that, it is what I want people to remember is recovery is possible, redemption is possible, and forgiveness is always available. Yeah. And I think that that's what I really learned out of it. You know, I think that I came to addiction through a lot of different events that happened in my life. I was, as I described at the prayer breakfast, was, was I being prepared or was I being punished? And I had to come to terms with that. And that was very difficult right. for me to come to. And, and so it started very early on. Lost my mom when I was very young. I was last of seven children. Um, uh, was put into foster care, moved around foster homes. I was fortunate enough to be uh, ended up in the Carter uh, household that my mother and father were Second World War veterans and um, they cared for foster babies. As a matter of fact, 22 from 1948 to 1962. And I was one of them and they adopted me and they had three of their own children. Um, so that was the first kind of hurdle uh, with adoption and coming to terms with that. Then going off to school as a youngster and having an uh, undiagnosed severe learning disability, which is very common today, which is called dyslexia, uh, but was not diagnosed in the 60s. And I spent a lot of time in the hallways and, and um, you know, not in the classroom. And that was very difficult. And then when I was about seven years old, I was a paper boy and I was raped by a, a stranger um, when I was doing my papers. And I never spoke about that until I was mm. 31. And then when I was 13, my brother Michael, that was a police officer and joined the police force in 1967, a father of three, moved just to Oshawa just at that time, um, was killed in a motorcycle accident at the age of 28. And that was devastating for me. And that was, that was kind of that turning point in regards to um, I had no self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth, like all of the things that you hope as a child that you would kind of gather. Right. Um, and um, I turned to alcohol, and it was at my brother's wake that I was introduced to alcohol. And what alcohol gave me was I was charismatic, and I was funny, and I was smart, and I was, or I thought that. And alcohol did that for me. And what happened was, is once I experienced that, then I, you know, you kept you kept seeking out alcohol, and because alcohol did so much, I wonder, you know, after a while, it stopped working. So then I. Inter interjection of drugs then goes hand in hand. And that journey took me for 17 years where I was mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, and spiritually broken until uh, June 17th of 1991 when I visited my sister and she said, you've got a choice today. You mm -hmm. either sober up or die. And I was so sick at that time. I was so broken. And, you know, I remember standing there, just tears running down my face, so scared and not knowing what to do, but I was blessed and lucky enough that my sister not only had the resources, but also knew the people that could help me at that time. And I was fortunate enough, but when I got into rehabilitation and I spent almost a year um, in that journey, it was the first time I talked about my dyslexia and right. how I felt about that and the bullying that went on. It was the first time I talked about being raped. I never ch shared that with my parents. I was so ashamed of what transpired. Um, I talked about how I felt about my brother and when he died. It was all those kind of things which was a safe space to actually be able to honestly just say, this is how I feel mm. and this is what I went through. And I was very, very fortunate. And, and you know, I did tremendous up till uh, May of 2000, the 17th day of, of May, when I got a phone call from my brother um, stating that my sister that uh, had saved my life ended her life. And that was... 
I would th say one of the most devastating events of my life because she was successful, she was smart, she didn't have addiction or mental health issues. Um, and she was such an influence on me. She always believed that there was the good in me. She always believed I would succeed at something. She always knew that I was smarter than I ever thought I was smart. Mm. And uh, when she took her life, it, to be absolutely honest, it, it devastated and it, And I still struggle with it even today because suicide never leaves you. And I think it always questions you. What could I have done? Right. What, why didn't I see that? So. There's so much there. Yeah, I know. Story. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm humbled that you're willing to be open to share about uh, like that. And, you know, uh, someone once said to me, a secret loses its power when it's no longer a secret. Yeah. And when you were able to open up and share the hurt and the challenge, it led to some transformation in you, transformation spiritually for you, yes. your faith journey. Yeah. Can you share just a, a couple seconds about that? Yeah, I mean, I went to, um, matter of fact, the gentleman at the time was Doug Snyder. He was uh, at the Embassy Church in Oshawa. And this is after Maureen had committed suicide. And I was struggling. I was really struggling. I didn't pick up any drugs or alcohol. I, I would never dishonor her, mm. but I was struggling with it. And I went to him and I just said, like, I'm really, really struggling and I, and I don't know, I don't know what to do. And he, um, he said, have you read your Bible? And I said, well, I grew up in a, in a Presbyterian church and, you know, my family went to church and I, I'm dyslexic, so I don't really understand the Old Testament. And he said, and he reached over into his desk and he handed me a book called The Message. And he said, I need you to read that. And I said, I want you to read two pages every day. And then you and I are going to meet on a, on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And um, I said, okay. I had nothing to lose and I was holding on for everything. Mm. And uh, I, we kept coming back and back. And I said to him at one time, I said, I didn't realize that the people that surrounded Jesus, like some of them were really bad guys. <laughs> like, and I, and I, that was a shock to me. And he said, that's really interesting. He said, why do you think that is, Danny? And I said, I, I don't know. And he said, could you relate to perfection? And I said, no, I couldn't. And he said, think about that then. So they're as broken as you, but isn't there a message in regards to their, all of us fit, all of us belong, all of us are loved, all of us are cared for. And I think that that really kind of, really kind of transformed my connection to my faith again. And, and I understood that as broken and as imperfect I was, that God loved me, that there was a place for me, that redemption was there, recovery was there, forgiveness was there, that a pathway was there. It was one of those moments that really changed my life forever. And by the way, there's days that I'm a really good Christian, and there's some days that I'm yeah. not a great Christian. Yeah. So I just want to make that clear. All right. of us. Right. Yeah. So it's, what a wonderful thing, though. And I, and I, I could relate to that yep. um, because brokenness I could relate to. And then I could understand why Jesus would use people that were so broken so that all of us are relatable because all of us are imperfect. Uh, thank you so much, the Honorable Dan Carter. <laughs> Honorable, I, thank I you. am just so thankful for your story, for God's work in you. Uh, friends, just as Dan has said, keep praying. And we have people standing by ready to pray with you to walk with you, to care for you, and to experience God's love with you together, please call our prayer center, 1-866-273-4444. And someone's standing by to pray with you today.